And Dara Mia say, whenever I leave the house, and on whatever thing my eyes fall on, Sabr. Allah Ta'ala say, Wallahu yuhibbu sabirin. Allah Ta'ala is with the Dalit Kina. School governing body of South Coast Madresa. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Tahira Jays, and this is an ITV exclusive interview with Sister Yvonne Ridley, a British journalist and patron of Cage UK. Cage UK is a human rights uh, group, an independent human rights group that supports families uh, who are affected by the war on terror. Sister Yvonne first came into contact with Cage in 2003, two years after her capture as a chief reporter for the Sunday Express by the Taliban in Afghanistan. Sister Yvonne, welcome. Salamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Maybe you could just start by telling us a little bit about why you're in South Africa. Yes, we've uh, come here for the launch of Africa Cage, which is the um, African chapter of the NGO uh, Cage UK. And where better to have the launch than in South Africa, which is a beacon of international human rights and with the legacy that it has and how it's emerged from the nightmare days of uh, apartheid. Mm. I think that uh, the location is superb for CAGE. Uh, what, what work is CAGE Africa hoping to do um, in, in Africa and, and why now? Why the launch at this time? Well, CAGE first came onto the stage after the emergence of Guantanamo Bay, where hundreds of men have been held without trial, without charge. It is a blot on the face of uh, human rights and Cage was the lone voice rattling the gates of Guantanamo in those early days. Of course, now human rights groups from around the world have joined in the call for the closure of Guantanamo. But uh, it hasn't happened. But even if it does, sadly, the war on terror, a legacy from the Bush years, continues and it has expanded and Africa is a key continent of um, unwelcome US intelligence. And unfortunately, there are dark sites, uh, prisons, torture um, happening in certain parts of Africa today under the guise of the war on terror, this never ending war. And so it was essential really that Cage's work would extend into Africa. Anyone going onto the website today will find a, an eye-watering report on the Horn of Africa about uh, some of the human rights atrocities that are being committed. Mm -hmm. And so it was, um, again, coming back to why I'm here, it was essential really that we set up some sort of base here and after talking to a group of really committed human rights lawyers uh, the birth of, of cage africa um, happened many people in south africa know cage through uh Mozambique. Mm -hmm. and what happened to him well, he, he, he was in South Africa for a time last year and affected a lot of people with his, with his personality as well as his story of being a prisoner in Guantanamo um, and his book. Uh, what is the status of, of Mozambique at this point? Well, Mozambique, as you said, was an ex-Guantanamo detainee, one of the many who was released without trial, without charge, um, and, and who had to rebuild his shattered life. The whole experience had a huge impact on him. 
and he has shared his harrowing experience in his book Enemy Combatant. But as uh, a, a director of CAGE, he has uh, travelled the world um, working with other human rights groups uh, to try and, and shine a light on the injustices of the war on terror. Uh, we can all see how bad Guantanamo is, but what Mozam has done and what his research has done has uncovered some very dark corners mm. around the world uh, which have exposed uh, Western intelligence services' complicity with some of the most brutal dictators um, in the world today. And, of course, uh, he was in Libya when uh, a whole raft of intelligence documents came to light which exposed what many saw as British complicity in the rendition, kidnap and torture of some um, senior Libyan dissidents. And his work obviously then moved to Syria because we do know that uh, the Syrian president, Assad, was an ally of the West, uh, did take uh, prisoners from America to um, interrogate, as only the Syrian intelligence machine knows how. And Mozam was hoping uh, that more documentation would come to light as the regime collapses. And it's crucial that uh, when the regime in Syria collapses, as inevitably it will, that the right people get their hands on these mm. documents to show transparency and to expose any duplicitous behavior. Mm. Um, unfortunately, it's hazardous work. It doesn't make you popular and he is now um, in prison awaiting a trial later this year. Uh, and, you know, there is a widely held belief that it is because of his human rights work that he finds himself in prison again, although his supporters are confident that uh, the trial will um, will see that uh, he walks free and hopefully will expose more duplicitous behavior from some very bad people in who are abusing their authority inshallah we hope inshallah that that um there's also been a lot of secrecy around moazam's uh, arrest and trial um and we know that journalists haven't been allowed to report on on the proceedings of the trial or any kind of the inner machinations of the case. Mm -hmm. um, and this reflects a broader policy on behalf of the British government towards Islamic organizations and the work of organizations like CAGE. Um, we've also heard that there's been some CAGEs in fact had their bank accounts frozen and um, are, are now having to fundraise almost door to door at this point. Um, what the British policy towards uh, Islam at this point is, is sort of crystallized in the prevent policy. Could, mm -hmm. could you t describe a little bit about how the prevent policy works? Yes, but if we could start first with the secrecy around the trial, yes. it is virtually unprecedented that the British media has been gagged and are not allowed to report on basic things like bail conditions, uh, and and, and um, elements of the trial. Obviously, most uh, pending trials are uh, covered by subjudice, so we have to be careful what we can report, but there are still elements that journalists can, but not in, in the Moa Zambek case. It's quite extraordinary that the British media has been censored, has been gagged, um, using draconian laws that are more akin to um, a tin pot dictatorship than one of the oldest democracies in the world. So that in itself is quite revealing. And the message is quite clear 
the British government does not want to encourage anyone going into Syria or near Syria during this conflict. And uh, th this extends to aid workers, to medics, to doctors who see on the nightly news children and women suffering and who feel compelled to go out and help or assist in any way they can. And the arrest of Mozambique was seen very much as a uh, fear campaign to prevent people from going out uh, to Syria to help mm. in a humanitarian capacity, never mind anything else. Now, you mentioned the PREVENT scheme. The PREVENT scheme was an ill-conceived idea uh, brought by the previous Labour government and the British intelligence services. It failed badly, um, but the Tory government um, in power in Britain today is trying to dust it down, revamp it, and put it back out again into the community. And the reality is it's like reheating an omelette in a microwave. It ain't going to work. Mm. It, it's... Um, it failed the first time, it will fail the second time. It's not trusted by communities. In fact, the only people who seem to benefit from Prevent are the ones who get copious amounts of government cash to, uh, to carry out these campaigns in the community, which are supposed to educate. But actually, uh, quite clearly, they're thinly disguised um, spying devices used in the community which ferment distrust and uh, and, and and paranoia in the muslim community in britain mm. it was quite striking as you you said walking through the apartheid museum and seeing uh, the similarities between the old apartheid government and and the current british government policies well i was wondering where prime minister david cameron got his uh, inspiration from and it was probably from the archives of apartheid South Africa. Thank you, Yvonne. We'll be right back. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. We're talking to Sister Yvonne Ridley of CAGE UK. Sister Yvonne, we were talking about the prevent policy of, of the British government um, and its, its strategy to um, combat extremism, what it defines as extremism. Could you give us some practical examples of how prevent has affected the Muslim community in Britain? Well, there have been various initiatives that on the surface seem perfectly innocent. Maybe a woman's uh, uh, group, a child and mother group, and uh, you have um, supervisors in there who are collecting or gathering intelligence um, on conversations that the mother and toddlers group might be having. Uh, there are cases of... Um, women holding women's circles where they discuss many things from childbirth to period pains to um, the price of food as well as maybe um, Islamic issues and again uh, the prevent scheme has moved in and uh, gathering information. No other community in the UK would tolerate this. Mm. It's um, inconceivable that you would have uh, special branch officers uh, working to find out um, what the local women's institute are discussing. But uh, it seems as though um, it's open season on Muslims in Britain. Um, something I hate to admit because I don't like to see us having a victim mentality mm. but it's very difficult when you have these crackpot schemes 
uh, funded by the government that are used as a means of spying on the community. And it seems that, uh, you know, everyone has been targeted. GPs, doctors have been asked to report on any signs of extremism. Well, you know, if you're with a thermometer and, and a stethoscope, how on earth are you supposed, you know, it, it's absolute nonsense trying to get people to, um, to turn people into um, spies in their community. And then um, on top of that, once having identified perhaps uh, particularly vulnerable people, uh, they get a visit from the police or the intelligence services and they're told we need you to spy on your community. We want you to go into um, your local mosque or your local women's group or mm. your, you know your local whatever group it is and spy and report back. Mm. Um, and they use personal information that they've gleaned you know, we know that you're getting married soon or we know that you're about to get divorced. We know that this is a trying time for you emotionally and financially. We will probably be able to help as long as you help us. And uh, we'd hate for anything to become really difficult for you at this challenging time. So basically they're using emotional blackmail and browbeating people into um, becoming spies. Quite often, um, these people have no information, no means of gathering intelligence, uh, no know-how mm. in this sort of subterfuge, mm. and, and they're completely at a loss. What I would say is if any sort of approach like that is made to you, go and see a lawyer, despite the threats that yes. the police or the intelligence services will make, a lawyer can make it stop because um, as long as they think they can work outside the law mm. some of these agencies um, will use every trick in the book mm. and and um, and they do target vulnerable people and I suppose that's where the work of cage also comes in in terms of supporting people who have experienced this kind of approach yes but C cage has a, a multi-pronged approach I mean um, this we need to educate people, we need to raise public awareness, we need to let them know that um, this is what is happening. Mm. Sometimes it comes as a great relief to individuals who will contact us and, and say, I thought I was alone. Mm. Um, I didn't realize that this is uh, common practice. And, and so, you know, it, it a cage is there as a safety net. We're there to help people who feel as though they've been trapped. Mm. And that's just one aspect of the advocacy work that, um, that CAGE does. Um, the, the work um, is very much um, international, but it also translates to uh, work on the ground locally mm. as well. Mm. How does this make you feel as a British citizen, um, seeing this kind of thing happening in your country and as a Muslim? Um, as a British person, I'm absolutely outraged. And, you know, when I was brought up in school uh, with British values, we always saw Britishness as, uh, as being straight, honest, open, fair, just uh, values that really should translate everywhere yeah. anyway. Um, I certainly see nothing British in sneaking around communities, sowing seeds of fear, uh, distrust, um, spreading this um, cancer. It, it's, that isn't British at all. As a Muslim, um, and of course I am relatively new to Islam, mm. I've been a Muslim now since 2003, I see this um, as an absolutely despicable way to target a community which um, is very solid in some ways, but lacking in confidence in other ways. Mm. And this lack of confidence um, makes it quite vulnerable. Mm. 
And some of the tactics used by the government have left me absolutely bereft, threatening people with removing their citizenship. Mm. In fact, the other day I was walking around the Apartheid Museum and I can only think, as I said before, this is from where David Cameron is getting his policies. You know, uh, because Britain is now removing people's citizenship and yet embraced within Nelson Mandela's uh, legacy is that the citizenship of every South African is protected mm. because he knew the feeling of insecurity and instability mm. within his own community. You know, the, the things that tear down communities. Mm. And uh, so it was wonderful to see this embraced in the, the new South Africa. Mm. And isn't it ironic that, um, you know, during his memorial service, the British Prime Minister was there with all the other European heads and, and the President of the United States eulogizing Nelson Mandela, while at the same time developing and formulating government policies that Mandela was committed to tearing up from apartheid South Africa. Mm. You know, the, um, the detention without trial in South Africa under uh, the apartheid regime was initially 90 days without charge or trial. The British government is nearly there now. Mm. So while South Africa is emerging into this brave new world it has created, a world free of injustices is what it's striving for, mm. the British government is going backwards mm. and emulating um, a brutal regime from South Africa's past, which has no place in the 21st century. And this is what I find so ironic that Britain and America were the flag bearers for democracy, trying to force democracy through the gun um, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And while they're trying to force their brand of democracy onto a people who don't want it, mm. back home, they're bombing our freedoms and liberties. Mm. And, uh, and, and unfortunately, it's the Muslim community in Britain, which is bearing the brunt of, uh, of these policies. So, Stefan, maybe we could talk a little bit about uh, the inter sort of work into the international work of CAGE and, and, and what they do on the international stage. But first, could you tell us a little bit about um, how, you, how you were introduced to CAGE? I was working in Al Jazeera in Qatar and we were trying to get some information about Guantanamo, which was, everybody knew of its existence, but nobody knew what was happening inside. Nobody knew who was inside. And then I discovered this heroic little organization, probably being run in someone's back kitchen, and they had a list of every single detainee. They had painstakingly gone through all sorts of um, avenues to, it was like a giant jigsaw puzzle and they had pulled together the identities of every single detainee, um, where they were picked up, how they were picked up. Because the common misconception about um, Guantanamo is that um, the majority of the detainees were picked up in Afghanistan fighting, but they weren't. There was no conventional battlefield. 95% of those in Guantanamo were kidnapped, renditioned from various parts of the world, including Africa, and taken to um, Guantanamo. So, again, you know, um, held indefinitely as some still are today. Mm. Thank you. We'll be right back after the break. <laughs> Salu alayhi 
وسلموا تسليما حتى تنالوا جنة ونعيما صلوا عليه السلام عليكم we're talking to sister Yvonne Ridley from Cage UK we were talking about uh, Guantanamo and, and what really goes on there. Well, um, as I say, CAGE was the, the first NGO to shine a light um, into Guantanamo in occupied Cuba. And not only did they discover the identities and nationalities of all those held, they also discovered an even more dark side, which was the um, method of t interrogations, which were quite clearly torture. And, and there is a report um, which will become in the public domain soon, uh, published by the CIA, in which they finally hold up their hands to say, yes, we did torture, we did waterboard, um, we did carry out interrogations that went beyond um, all the conventions demanded under international law. Uh, the Americans went on a psychological wrecking spree, uh, destroying the lives of those men who they held captive in uh, Guantanamo. You filmed a documentary on Guantanamo Bay. Yes, I was in there for four days. Uh, with um, uh, uh, filmmaker David uh, Miller and we were appalled by what we saw. Everything was clinically clean but it was the complete dehumanization, the determination by this prison regime to rob every individual of their identity. Every cell was identical. Uh, there were no personal um, paraphernalia, pictures, letters up on the walls, nothing of a personal nature to show that this person came from a certain country, to show that this person had a family. Mm. It was completely dehumanizing. And uh, even I, I felt that the guards themselves um, were suffering because uh, they would tell me if this prisoner isn't compliant we remove his toilet roll and he can't have um, tissues uh, unless he asks for them and as you know well what happens then well I will count out 15 pieces of paper before I hand them to the detainee and I'm thinking you know this is a trained soldier how humiliating is it for him to tear off 15 pieces from a toilet roll before handing them to a prisoner? Mm. And uh, it, was, um, it was really quite, quite eye-opening. One soldier told me that the reason he joined the US military was so that he could get a college education um, after he'd finished his service, and he said, I was amazed when I got here because all of the detainees, they've all had college education. They're all highly educated men when you get talking to them. And so this, um, this bond did develop with some of the detainees and the prisoners, prison officers. And in fact, Cage held a very memorable tour um, involving ex-Guantanamo guards who had subsequently converted to Islam mm. and they went around the UK. It was an incredibly moving mm. uh, tour to listen to these men who, who had um, not changed sides but had changed faith, mm. although the US military felt as though they had changed sides yeah. because everything in, in there was black and white. Mm. You know, it was very much the George Bush rhetoric. You were either with us mm. or you're with the terrorists. Mm. There was no yeah. in between. Yvonne, you um, embraced Islam in 2003 mm -hmm. um, and you were also a captive yes. of the Taliban. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about how you were captured and, mm. and uh, the conditions of your capture? 
I was uh, the chief reporter of the Sunday Express newspaper and I had uh, sneaked into Afghanistan um, because I couldn't get a visa from the Taliban. So I sneaked in, it was after 9-11 but before the war and I worked undercover for two days trying to get a feel of what life must be like for ordinary Afghans under the Taliban and as I made my way back to the Pakistan border um, I was on a donkey and fell off it and that triggered a series of events which led to my arrest and I genuinely thought I will not survive the night. The rhetoric had very much been that the Taliban was the most brutal evil regime in the world. They hated women. So I just thought, I, I, I won't see the sunset tonight. What happened um, was a remarkable 10, 11 days in their um, captivity in which I was convinced that I was going to die. And far from being compliant, I just decided that um, I would be the prisoner from hell. Now you would have thought that the most evil, brutal regime in the world would have responded by just shooting me on the spot for shouting at them, swearing at them, throwing things at them, abusing them. But instead, they responded with um, kindness, courtesy. They were remarkably calm and were saying, why are you unhappy? We want you to be um, happy, you are our guest. And uh, some years later, as you know, I went to Guantanamo. And after what I saw in Guantanamo, and after the stories from prisoners like Moa Zambeg about the torture and abuse they received, I just think, thank God I was captured by the most evil, brutal regime in the world and not by the Americans. Um, I was released on uh, the orders of Mullah Omar, the Taliban spiritual leader. Uh, I was released on humanitarian grounds and I walked back across the, uh, the Pakistan border. I don't know who was happier, me or the Taliban. I think they were so pleased to see the back of me and I was so happy to see the back of them. But um, the whole episode triggered in me a desire to know more about Islam because I clearly recognized by observing the Taliban up close and personal that Islam was more than a faith, it was a way of life. It was a life system, the way you eat, the way you sleep, the way you drink, the way you behave, the way you um, conduct your daily life. And so I started to read is, um, about Islam. I was already a practicing Christian, so I had this core belief in God anyway. And two years later, I ended up embracing Islam, moving from what set out as an academic exercise into a spiritual journey. Unlike a lot of converts, I wasn't looking for anything. I wasn't looking for um, something new. I was quite happy with the way my life was. Mm. And then I started reading this remarkable book, the Holy Quran, mm. and it changed my life. And then, um, you know, fast forward all these years, I come to South Africa for the launch of Cage Africa. And who am I sharing a platform with? But um, a representative of one of my captors, the former ambassador, um, Muller uh, Zaif, who, who was the ambassador in Islamabad. And, if somebody had told me um, when I was covering the first ever press conference where he emerged and, and spoke about um, the impending war on his country, if somebody had said, in 13 years time, you will share a platform with that man and you'll be calling him your brother, I would have thought that they were crazy. But that is uh, the reality. And so, um, the launch of Africa Cage was um, quite a, 
a milestone in that journey uh, for both me and him mm. because um, Mullah Zaif must have um, been in Guantanamo when I was visiting because uh, he had in fact been handed over and uh, by the Pakistan authorities to the Americans, sold like a slave for money, um, all protocol thrown away. And, and he ended up being abused like everybody else in Guantanamo. Thoroughly shocking. Mm. Yes, indeed, the launch of Cage was quite poignant to, mm -hmm. to be able to look as an audience member at, at you and at Mullah Zaif uh, together on the same platform. Alhamdulillah. That's a wonderful moment. Yes. We'll be back after the break. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to this ITV exclusive with Sister Yvonne Ridley. Uh, Sister Yvonne, we were talking about your embracing Islam. What was the, you obviously a very public person, so what was the reaction in terms of the British public uh, to your embracing Islam? Well, most people were dumbstruck. Um, they didn't know that I was a practicing Christian. Um, religion is not something that's openly discussed in newsrooms. Journalists are quite a cynical bunch. So I got away with being a practicing Christian without anybody knowing um, for years because um, I happened to feel that uh, religion is very much a private affair. My relationship with God was very much a one-to-one, -one, um, although I would go to church on Sundays. Um, but of course, in Islam, the moment you put on a hijab, you're immediately propelled into the front lines, short sword fighting in defense of Islam, whether you want to or not, you know, you're immediately identified as a Muslim woman. And people were horrified. The BBC started referring to me as the former journalist, Yvonne Ridley, as though I could no longer be capable of interviewing or writing or, or doing anything like that. Um, my family were quite distraught, uh, not on any religious basis, because I was the only one in the family who had uh, practiced Christianity in as much as I went to church maybe twice a month, which is bordering on fanaticism in secular Britain. Um, so it, it, there was an adverse reaction. Uh, the Most of the anger and, and inexplicable anger came from uh, the secular mm -hmm. community who couldn't understand why uh, somebody who had a reputation as being a party girl would embrace Islam, a religion that they thought um, oppressed and subjugated women. So they were trying to find reasons why, and they said, well, has she married a Muslim man? No. Um, well, there must be a reason why she's done this. Um, Stockholm syndrome, and this is the a uh, syndrome where a, a prisoner bonds with their captor. And uh, so the popular myth was, well, she's obviously embraced Islam because she was brainwashed by the Taliban, uh, which couldn't be further from the truth because, it, as we'd heard earlier in the program, um, I was the prisoner from hell. And, and they were just so glad to see me go. And I was so glad to see the back of them that, uh, you know, that there was mutual loathing, not um, understanding. So it, uh, people were shocked. Um, and unfortunately, uh, there has been such a demonization process about Islam that as, uh, as soon as um, anybody starts talking about Islam or Muslims, you can see word association, mm. um, the word terrorism comes up 
or suicide bomber rule. Mm. And, and so it was, uh, it, it was quite a shock the way that, um, that people reacted. Uh, I lost some friends. People no longer wanted to talk to me. Um, it was really quite hurtful. Mm. But uh, embracing Islam seems also to have galvanized you as a journalist mm -hmm. um, and has also brought you into contact um, with a remarkable sister, uh, Dr. Afia Siddiqui. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell us a little bit about uh, the circumstances around Dr. Siddiqui's arrest since you broke the story mm -hmm. um, and, and where the case is now? Well, actually, it was um, while I was interviewing um, a researcher from CAGE that the story of Dr. Afia Siddiqui began to unfold. And here was a highly educated um, mother of three, um, born in Pakistan, educated at university level at, at uh, MIT in, in America, one of the finest universities in the world. And she was kidnapped from a taxi in Karachi, put into a people carrier in a joint operation with the Pakistan authorities, possibly the ISI and US intelligence. And she just disappeared. And there was uh, no known reason why Afia Siddiqui would have been targeted in such a way. One can only assume that uh, her arrest and detention was like so many others carried out by the US. It was based on a malicious tip-off, somebody with a vendetta, an axe to grind against her or her family. And, you know, this is why the cages in Guantanamo began filling up rapidly after the war on terror started because people wanted to settle scores and they got the gullible Americans to do their dirty work for them. Unfortunately, Afia, Dr. Afia Siddiqui was caught up in this and she disappeared along with her three children. The narrative that came out was that uh, this woman had gone on jihad to Afghanistan now, any mother listening to this show today will be laughing because um, any woman with three children under the age of five doesn't even contemplate going to the corner shop to buy some milk, never <laughs> mind taking three kids into a war zone in Afghanistan where you couldn't even wheel a pram because the roads are covered and baked and caked in mud. It, it was a nonsense, but unfortunately US intelligence is a contradiction in terms and this narrative came out. Then the FBI um, came out with this astonishing story that she had spent um, uh, the previous summer in Sierra Leone buying conflict diamonds uh, for Al Qaeda. Her lawyer, because the family appointed a lawyer um, to try and find out where she was, her lawyer said, um, this is a ridiculous story. Um, of course she wasn't in Sierra Leone. She was actually running a nursery project for children in Boston, <laughs> in America, and <laughs> between these dates, and completely blew this ridiculous story out of the water. Everything went quiet for some years. Um, I became involved and, and through some good fortune, I stumbled on the fact that uh, Afia was being held in Bagram prison and her prison number was 650. The American um, administration denied this. They said I was a fantasist, uh, that I was making this up that there was no Afia Siddiqui in Bagram. Furthermore, there were no women prisoners in Bagram. And so I began to dig a bit more. I got two um, eyewitnesses who had served many years in Bagram, 
who confirmed there was a woman there. Her treatment and condition was so appalling that the entire prison in Bagram went on hunger strike until she was removed because uh, she had no privacy. She was forced to use an open toilet in full view of all the male prisoners. She was forced to shower in full view of all of the male prisoners. She was sexually abused by US soldiers in front of all of the male prisoners. And as soon as this started to emerge, the Americans were in denial and then suddenly there was a reversal and they said, uh, oh, actually, yes, you're right, there was a woman prisoner. Um, we forgot about her, and, and, um, but she's, she's been returned home. They wouldn't tell me which country she came from. Uh, they confirmed that her number had been 650, but they denied that it was Afia Siddiqui. So I then went back to Pakistan and asked the media for help. More than 100 journalists turned up and I toured the length and breadth of Pakistan asking people, please help me find prisoner 650. Even if she doesn't want to go on the record, if she just tells me it was me and I'm home and fine and well and leave me alone, that's fine. And you can't keep secrets in Pakistan. It's, it's a fantastic place. It's a wonderful society and I, I love the people there. It's like a second home for me. And everybody was searching for this woman. Of course, nobody came forward because the woman was Afia Siddiqui. And this was finally confirmed when um, another detainee, Binyam Mohammed, returned from Guantanamo and the first interview he gave was to me to say the woman that I saw in Bagram was Dr. Afia Siddiqui. I didn't know who she was. You have shown me this photograph and the woman in this photograph is the woman I saw in Bagram. And of course the photograph was Dr. Afia Siddiqui. Despite all of this, the Americans are still in denial. Um, but in the meantime, while I was hunting all corners of Pakistan for Afia Siddiqui and making quite a lot of headlines, she suddenly appeared in Ghazni, in, um, Af in Afghanistan, in the most ridiculous scenario that could only have come from the fant fantasy world that is US intelligence. Mm. She was found wandering on her own, which women never ever do in Afghanistan, but she was found wandering on her own, carrying a handbag with three or four different types of chemical explosives and pictures of the Manhattan skyline. Now, I tell you, mm -hmm. you know, does, and, and when she was arrested, the police chief who I interviewed when I went there said to me, this woman was mentally disturbed. She had obviously spent many months in an abusive environment, quite likely a prison because of the pallor of her skin. Um, she hadn't seen daylight. And this iconic photograph of Afia slumped mm. to one side, we thought had been taken after she was shot. That was the state she was in before she was shot. And, and yet the Americans are wanting us to believe that this woman in this state was Mrs. Al-Qaeda, who was this deadly ninja warrior who could take on the world. You know, she couldn't even snap a twig when you looked at the, the state of her. Mm. And um, of course, there was another epic US scenario um, where she ended up being shot by US soldiers and she is the one who was charged with attempted murder. You couldn't make this story up. I feel very passionate about it. She is, in my view, the most wronged woman on the planet. She 
has not committed any crime at all that I am aware of. And yet the media, the gullible Western media, fall for this um, fantastic story mm. that wouldn't survive in Hollywood as a plot. Somebody would read it and say, no, this is too far-fetched. Mm. But um, the, the media, unfortunately, there are elements of the media that sit there and are spoon-fed. They don't use their mind. They just regurgitate whatever is told to them. And uh, that, you know, that is not journalism. The end result is that uh, she was tried in New York for a crime allegedly committed in Afghanistan. Mm. Now, America has always said it is not in occupation in Afghanistan. It was there to help establish a new government. So if this is the case, why rendition mm. a woman of Pakistani nationality who had allegedly committed a crime in Afghanistan, why rendition her to New York to stand trial? What jurisdiction? There was no jurisdiction. The, the whole case should be thrown out because there was no legal basis for the trial. I wrote and told US uh, Attorney General Eric Holder, I tried to fax the trial judge um, uh, Mr. Berman, Justice Berman, that uh, his trial was illegal. And his response was to forbid me from sending that fax. And I told his clerk, you have to tell Judge Berman he has no jurisdiction in London. He might think that he has it in Afghanistan and he certainly has it in New York, but how dare he forbid me from sending a fax to him? Mm. I said, switch off the fax machine if you don't want to receive this message. And in the end, I sent him a letter by uh, courier to make sure that he got it, to say, I am telling you now, there is no legal basis for this trial. Mm -hmm. But, you know, she ended up getting 86 years in prison. Um, and she's now serving her time in, um, in this hellhole in Texas. So, Stevan, um, thank you very much for sharing your passion and your insight and your knowledge, as well as your journey into Islam with us. Well, thank you for allowing me to tell it. And, and any of the cases that I've discussed today, you can get on mm. the um, CAGE websites. Mm. And um, we just pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthens you and your efforts and, and that he grants CAGE success. Mm -hmm. uh, here and around the world, inshallah. Yes, inshallah. I mean, thank you very much for joining us uh, with this ITV exclusive interview with Sister Yvonne Ridley. If you would like uh, any more information on the cases uh, that CAGE takes on, as well as uh, if you would like to find out how to become involved in CAGE Africa um, or in CAGE UK, you can go to the website. That's www.cageuk.org or www cageafrica.com. They're on Twitter at at UK underscore cage and on Facebook uh, at Cage UK. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> جنة ونعيما صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما حتى تنالوا جنة ونعيما صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما حتى تنالوا جنة ونعيما صلوا عليه